Good morning, church family. Man, that's a hot mic. Good to see you all here. Appreciate you all being here. Visitors, we were glad to have you here as well. I can't think of a better way to start the first Sunday of the new year, 2019, than to be with my family, worshiping with y'all in spirit and in truth. And it's good to see all of you. Some of you have probably just returned back from all your vacationing and your summer trips. And some of you probably still have Christmases to do. I know that my family just got through doing a Christmas at her family's place. And so it's uh, the holiday just keep on going even though it's already January 6th. But hey, don't forget about some things. That, make sure you're reading your bulletin and checking your bulletin in the calendar. Um, we, on, on the 27th, the last Sunday of this month, we're having uh, what we've done before. We're having a Blue Jean Sunday. And a Blue Jean Sunday is where we are literally collecting blue jeans. Uh, blue jeans that uh, can be used if you uh, have, uh, if you for whatever way, you've gotten too big or too small, and you have some blue jeans you need to get rid of, bring them up here. And we'll, we'll find a place for them. We are going to collect, we'll, we'll take whatever we can get. Uh, uh, the, uh, some of the sizes that we are specifically looking for are sizes for our kindergarten aged kids at school and I believe those sizes are in the bulletin but if you don't have those sizes and you still want to donate bring them up here because the, the clothes closet in our town will probably will more than likely take them and use them and it will be a, just another way that we can communicate and be a part of and meet the needs of our community so if you can be prepared for blue jean Sunday bring your blue jeans and wear your blue jeans and and uh, we will have a Sunday where we can help out and be a part and do some good for our community. <clears throat> so, um, a couple who are in their 80s, 90s, both were living still married, still you know, still together, and they've been married for a long time. But because of the age and how things progress with uh, couples that who are of that age, sometimes they have a problem remembering things. During the checkup, the doctor tells them that they are physically okay, but that they might want to think about writing some things down that they want to remember or need to remember. And so one night while watching TV, the, the husband, the old husband, gets up from his chair and talks to his wife and says, Do you want anything from the kitchen? And the wife says, Well, sure, that, that's nice of you. I, I think I'll have a bowl of ice cream. All right, I'll go get it for you. And she says, Now, I, I like strawberries in my ice cream. Can you put strawberries in? And he says, Yeah, I can put strawberries in your ice cream. The wife says, the old wife says, well, do you want to write this down so you can remember it? He says, hey, I think I can remember to cut up strawberries and put it in your ice cream. Well, okay. And she says, but you know, I also, I'd like to have some whipped cream in my ice cream. So can you think you can remember to put whipped cream and strawberries in with my ice cream? Or do you want to write that down? He goes, you want a bowl of ice cream, you want sliced strawberries, and you want some whipped cream on it. Is that, I, I got it. So 20 minutes later, he comes back and he's got a plate of bacon and eggs and hands it to his wife. The wife looks at it, looks back up at him and says, where's the toast? This year, if it's the Lord's will, we're going to spend an entire um, uh, um, a year of Sundays looking at and studying and uh, refreshing ourselves Reminding ourselves, if you were, if you will, on the things that that the Bible, that God, that we are commanded to remember, not to forget. And I'm sure that while you were thinking about this, you're thinking, well, yeah, there's, there's, there are some. I can, you can recall some Bible verses in the Bible that talks about things to remember. You know, do we just we just took communion. And a part of that was when Jesus told his disciples, you do this in remembrance of me. 
And so, yeah, we'll spend some time talking about that. But there's other passages of Scripture in the Bible that tell us, uh, remind us, hey, don't forget this. Be reminded of this. And we're going to look at some of those today and throughout the year. And so this year, we're, uh, while, while, the, uh, while the, the, it's, we're going to call it the Remember series, you know, I, I, I like to think about it also as this, uh, what we're going to start out today about this phrase, the phrase that we all, we, we've known, but we know we've heard before. Some of us have, can remember, it's a, it's, it's a line from a song, Here I Raise My Ebenezer. Probably one of my one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is found in 1 Samuel 7. And so, but before we get into that, I want to kind of give you a, a, why it's, you know, we, we want to make sure that we, you know, that we're going to look at this, the stone named Ebenezer and the reasons why it's so important for us to understand why Samuel did that. One of the reasons why Samuel did this, and we're going to look at the events, but one of the things was he didn't want us to forget. Don't forget to remember is, is something that can be understood as, as, part of our, as part of why it's important. One of the reasons why it's important is because I believe that because we have been given the power of free choice, we are created to be people who have the ability to have free choice, that God doesn't want us to forget some important things. If there was no free choice, there would be no need to remember anything because we would already be pre-programmed to have these things in our head. But we are a society that forgets. We are a society, a, a group of people that gets busy. And so because of that, we have to have reminders. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 10 says, Therefore, my brothers, be all the eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail. Fall, excuse me. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, So I will remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Christ has made it clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that my, after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Peter was so had such a desire for the people that he has been working with to keep recalling the things that have been done for you, the establishment of this new religion, this new church, this, this new congregation of Christ that was happening and taking place, and he didn't want you to forget. And he says, look, I know that you know these things. But because you're human, because we're, because we're all human, there has to be, there needs to be a reason to be reminded of. So don't forget to remember that these things are important. These things are why you are, why who you are. These things are the reasons why you became a Christian in the first place. The things that you admired and desired and wanted, you need to be reminded of. And it doesn't change just because of your age either. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 says, However, if you continue in these things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and from that childhood you have been known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through the faith in Christ Jesus... Because all scriptures God breathed and purpose for teaching and reproof and correction and training, so that the men of God may be equipped in every good work. And so there's verse after verse that talks about why it's so important to not to forget, to be reminded of. And so in Samuel 7, in 1 Samuel 7, a big event happened in the Old Testament. 
Now, in all honesty, well, the, the, the story that, that Colton read this morning was only the end of a bigger story that happened uh, in, that started out in chapter 4. If you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the Philistines came and they formed up their army, but because uh, Eli the priest and his son, because his sons, Eli the priest, had sinned and, and committed these great sins, not only was Eli, uh, um, um, Eli's sons were going to die, but Eli also was going to lose his life. But when the Philistines formed their army, they got the Ark of the Covenant to take it out. And the Ark of the Covenant became more than just a symbol of what it was supposed to be. The Ark of the Covenant became a, kind of like a mascot, a good luck charm. And they said, well, we got the Ark here. The, if we got the Ark, then God's with us. And if we got God with us, then we're going we're gonna to clean these Philistines' clock. But it just so happened that the events turned the other way around. And it was a horrible battle for the Hebrews. And the Philistines not only got away with, uh, with, with, the, with the, got the victory, but they also took the Ark with them. And to celebrate their victory, they took the Ark of the Covenant, they took it to their temple, and, and uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in First Samuel 5, they take it and they stick it in their temple of, with, with Dargon, their god. They think, hey, we're just going to we're going to collect these items and we're going to put them right by them. The next morning, they get up, they go to the temple to check things out, and Dargon, their priest, had, their their god, their statue of their god, had fallen over, and its face was planted on the ground and right in front of the ark, as if it were bowing down to it. They say, well, that can't be right. Must something happen to it. So they pick it back up. They set him back up. They go home. The next day they come back, and not only had he had fallen over again, the, the statue of Dargon had broken into pieces. Then they started experiencing problems with a major rat infestation. They started getting boils on their skin. And the people in the town were like, get this thing out of Dar the temple of Dargon and get it out of our town. So they do. They take it to another town. And when the Ark of the Covenant arrives at that town, the same thing happens. They get more plagues and more problems. So finally all the priests get together, they have a meeting, they said, look, this was a mistake. We should not have taken this Ark back. We need to get this thing out of here. Let's send it back to the Hebrews. And they do. They put it on a cart, they put some oxen on it, and the oxen go. They don't turn to the left or the right. They go all the way back and they stop at a certain place. And there was much rejoicing. The priests come and they get it and they take it and they take it to this guy's house and they put it in this guy's house and, for, and, it, and the ark stays there for about 20 years. Well, when Samuel finally hears that the ark's come back, he starts off in chapter 7 by saying, look, if you really want to have this work for you, then you've got to stop sinning. You've got to get rid of all your idols. And they did. They did. But I want you to notice and pay attention to what happened while they were offering this, having this special worship service. If you go back and look at, in, in chapter 7, it says, When the Philistines saw that they had gathered at Mezpah, they got their army together. You see, all this time that this was happening, with the ark traveling back, the Philistines were sitting up there watching all these events take place. And so when the Hebrew, when they saw that the Hebrews got excited about their Ark of the Covenant coming back and they formed around the Ark, they assumed, hey, they're going to take that Ark and do whatever they need to do and they're going to come back and whoop us with it. And so the Philistines form another army. But they, had, but they made one major problem. And the problem was that God was being worshipped that day. Now you think about this. God was being worshipped that day. Sacrifices were being offered. Confessions of sins were being offered. The Israelite people were in, literally, for all terms and purposes, they were in church. And an army decides to form up outside. Ready to form their battle lines. 
Now, if that were to happen to us today and someone comes running into the door saying, there's an army outside ready to take us on, what would we do? Oh my gosh, we got to go. Hurry. We jump up, we grab all of our stuff, we try to get in and try to do some kind of aid. But what? no, did you notice what the Hebrew people said? Go back and look. What did they say? They said, that they told Samuel something very specific. They told Samuel, while they were offering sacrifices, don't stop praying for us, Samuel. We don't need you to lead our army. We don't need you to, to take up arms. We are in the middle of worship. The Philistines are at our door. But man, this is far more important than us going out and fighting those Philistines. Please don't stop calling out to God for us. And what does God do? God sends the thunder. God sends the lightning. Have you ever been sitting in your house or at your office and you look out your window, oh, it's a nice day outside. And all of a sudden, it gets dark and gray. And all of a sudden, you hear the rumbling and the thunder and it gets your attention. What God did that day got the Philistines' attention so bad that they didn't even swing a sword at anybody. They turned tail and ran. And the Hebrews chased them. Chased them all the way to Bethkar. And it was such a traumatic, a, a, a great event knowing that one, the Hebrews didn't have to do a whole lot. But why? Because they were doing what God wanted them to do in the first place. Later on, he tells Samuel, tells Saul, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And that's exactly what they were doing. Samuel said, if you want to get this right, you've got to stop sinning and get rid of all your idols. And they did. They, got, they, stopped, they, got, they offered their sacrifices of confession. They confessed their sins. They cut down all their idols. And they were in the middle of worshiping God. And when you are worshiping God, that is, that is why you were created, church. And God's not going to let anything disrupt that. No army, no distraction, no nothing. If your heart is right and you are connected with God the way He wants you to be, there is nothing that's going to stop you from completing what you're trying to do. No army. Nothing. Because they didn't say, Hey, Samuel... Wrap this up real quick. Offer the invitation because we got to go out and fight these Philistines. No, they didn't say that. They understood what was more important. And they said, Samuel, we got guys at the door ready to, ready to whoop up on us, but we know this is far important. Don't stop worshiping. Don't start calling on the Lord for it. And God brought the thunder. And God brought the lightning. So he took, takes a stone and he sets it up on its side. I don't know how big it is. I don't know how large it was. I mean, it could have been the size of a basketball. He could have gotten some beefy guys to help him lift this thing up and set it up on its side. But he names it Ebenezer. Because Ebenezer means, literally, thank you, Lord, for the help you've provided us so far. Now, what does all of that have to do with any of this? It has to do with this. Being reminded is a good thing. Years later, when a father and a son or a mother and a daughter or a group of people are walking by and they see this <coughs> normally flat stone that's around other flat stones up on its side, standing straight up on its end, they know that one, that's not natural. No flat stone sets up on its side like that. Someone had to put that thing up there. And so someone will say, hey, what's that stone? And some old Hebrew, 20 years later, you remember, that, remember the events and said, that stone is named Ebenezer. Well, who names a stone Ebenezer? Well, one of our great prophets of old named that stone Ebenezer because on the day that stone was named, we were having church and the enemy was at the door. But instead of being, being afraid, instead of thinking, instead of changing our priorities, 
instead of instead of being uh, uh, instead of ha losing faith, we double down on our on, we double down on our worship. We told the preacher, "Don't stop. Continue what you're doing because this is more important." And we know if we are doing this because to obey is better than sacrifice, the Lord will take care of us. And the Lord sent a crazy storm that sent those, those Philistines packing. Does anybody still tie strings to their fingers today? I don't think so. I think we're, I think we're past that. But for those of you who are young, you little kids, you, you might can hear stories of people walking around with strings tied to their fingers because it was a reminder that they had to go do something or pick up something up or do something. Nowadays, we have, nowadays we have gadgets. We have phones that beep at us. We have tablets that have, we have calendars and we have notepads and we have notebooks and uh, we have all these things that help us keep track of all the things that we're supposed to do and not to forget and everything else. But in the end, though, it doesn't change. As much, men, and I'm sorry, guys, men, husbands, as much as we don't want to, it's okay to understand that being reminded is a good thing. Being reminded of the things we're supposed to do, things we're supposed not to do, supposed to do all that stuff. For, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with Him, we'll also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we disown Him, He will disown us. If we are faithless, He will remain faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. Then He says, Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against the quarreling about words. It's no value. It only ruins those who listen. But he says, remind them of these things. Remind them of what? Remind them that if we died, if we, if we died with Him, we'll live with Him. Remind the people that you're working with that if we endure, we will reign with Him. Make sure you don't make them, let them forget that if we disown Him... He will also disown us. But encourage them to remember and not to forget, Timothy, that if we are faithless, He will remain faithful because He can't disown Himself. Warn them. Remind them. Remind them. And so, yes, there are some things that we are not called to forget. We use reminders all the time, don't we? For many of us, there's a reminder on the third finger of your left hand. Some, some, some of you guys got them fancy silicone rings on. Some of you guys got other rings on. For, thus, for those of us who have said, I do, this is a reminder. A piece of valuable metal that says love never ends. Love must be cherished. And love can cost us, but it's worth it. Some of us have rings on the other hand as a reminder. Where we graduated from, what school we went to. Some of us have reminders that we see when we walk into our doors at home, we'll see something that reminds us of something. Maybe, men, you have a, a tool in your toolbox or an item on your desk that's a family heirloom. My wife has a, a small little one cup flour sifter that has a, it, 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 it slide, it, it has a hand crank on it that sifts flour. It's a, one, it's a little bitty thing. And she only uses it every, every once in a while. And I'm, I'm not saying she doesn't cook anymore. I'm just saying, you know, she, you know, she uses, you know, she has, she's got bigger stuff. She's got fancier stuff. She's got more technological stuff. But when she pulls out that little aluminum small tin flour sifter, it reminds her of my grandmother who made the best chicken and dumplings in the world. There's a, 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 a copper music player, music box in Jackson's room. It's a pump jack. It belonged to Jackson's great-grandfather. 
And if you put a rubber, if he's, he's trying to get the rubber band to work so, it, so that when you play the music, the pump jack works. We all have reminders. Wedding rings, college rings, necklaces, jewelry, pieces in your house. Some of you may be driving your reminders. Some of you may have reminders in your truck. Certain reminders remind us that, yeah, that we have a job to do and we've got to do it. Certain reminders that well, we've got a bill to pay and we've got to pay it. But certain reminders remind us of things that we want and not to forget. Pictures in your wallet, pictures on your phone, pictures on your computers. Whatever. It's okay. It's okay because we tend to forget. But perhaps, just perhaps, maybe we need more Ebenezer type reminders. Perhaps you need an Ebenezer that reminds, that reminds you of the day you got saved. The day you took on Christ in baptism. Perhaps you need an Ebenezer that reminds you of the day that you, when you were dealing with some terrible illness, fighting some terrible uh, illness, that that was the day that you got to announce that you were cured and free. Perhaps you need an Ebenezer that reminds you of the day that you finally got a victory over a problem that has been plaguing you for a long time. And you've been waiting for this day. Waiting for this day to be freed from this problem. And that, maybe you need an Ebenezer to remind you of that day. What kind of Ebenezers do you have? What kind of Ebenezers do you want to have? Ultimately, as Christians, we have our own Ebenezers. You see, that stone, it's probably gone now. I don't think biblical historians or those who go and look for artifacts in, biblical, in the Bible lands have found the stone named Ebenezer. If they have, I haven't seen it. So, in my opinion, Ebenezer's probably gone. Fell over, cracked up, rumbled, washed away, whatever. But for us, other things have maybe taken its place. Maybe this is our Ebenezer. Some of you may be thinking, well, Bland, how come you don't have a picture of the cross on there? Well, I don't, I don't have an issue with the cross. I'm thankful for the cross of Jesus. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm not thankful for... The cross itself, I'm thankful for the Son of God who volunteered, who stepped up and said, I will go. No one's going to make me. No one's going to put me up there. I'm going to go on my own will. So I am thankful for the cross. But I would submit to you that while this may not be a stone of Ebenezer, that the empty tomb says a lot about what we are called to remember. Whenever you see the tomb, maybe you see a place of remembrance. We remember the person who died on that cross, who was placed in that tomb, but isn't there anymore. Who conquered death. And because we believe and obey and given our lives to Him as Lord and Master, we too will not have to stay in the ground or in a tomb. We will also rise again. This tomb is the result of the way He died. And yes, we remember that. But more importantly, we remember why He died and was placed in that tomb. To save the soul. To be the ultimate cure for our sin problem. And so whenever I see the tomb, it's a place of recognition. We recognize that even in the darkest times, God is still with us. We recognize that God is among us and desires to have a place. Desires for you to have a place in His life. So whenever we see the tomb, we see a revelation. Perhaps this tomb shows me how I can find relief from my sin. 
And I was saved. Saved from the power of death. Perhaps this is our Ebenezer. And it shows me that I can have victory. Victory because I made a commitment. The commitment was that I am not going to stop doing what God commanded of me to do. Even if the enemy is at the gate, I will put God first in my life. No matter what happens, no matter, who's in, no matter who is trying to threaten me, scare me, run me off, tempt me, distract me, or convince me otherwise, as long as I am putting God first, God will take care of the rest. This morning, if you are subject to the invitation, if you would like the prayers of the church, if you would like to receive some counseling and help, we can anyway, please come forward right now as we stand and as we sing.